Hello, today we're talking about Lumiere, a space-time diffusion model for video generation by Google Research. This paper is, it's pretty insane. So you put in text and you get out video. And there are some other of these models around and I find them all impressive, but just look at this. So the text to image models have become so good that the next frontier is now text to video. So you input a text, you can see the prompts here if I tap on these. Uh, and from that, every single pixel that you see is just hallucinated from the text prompt, which is insane. Um, so, and you can see this goes from sort of minimal motion um, to quite large changes in sort of the pixels of the image, for example, it's fish eye lenses for the dog or background sort of camera pans around the car right here, quite dramatic pans. So this, it's, I have to say it's quite impressive. Also note that it says a red Lamborghini coming around a bend in a mountain road, but the model sort of puts racing, racing strips uh, next to the car, which I find quite amusing. Um, the learned correlation there. Uh, yeah, so this is, it's certainly a step up from what we've seen before. Also things like the fluids on the ice cream and so on. Um, these these look look already quite, quite good. And if you compare them to text to video models from like one or two years ago, the, the advantage is dramatic. Um, I know there are things works around stable diffusion that are also very impressive. So this is not to be said that this is the only impressive model currently in, in existence. Once they have this model, this text to video model, they can then do different things with it, such as image to video. So provide the first frame plus a prompt. Um, the first frame could be real, could also be generated. And then sort of the, the model will continue the video uh, from that first frame, according to the prompt, you can do stylized generation. And that is something really, really cool. Uh, what we'll see in the paper is they built the whole thing on a pre-trained text to image model, which means they essentially just add a few parameters on top of something like stable diffusion or, or imagine or something like this. Um, and when, when they now have their trained video model that makes videos like you saw above, they can swap out those pre-trained weights. Uh, and if you swap them out with like some stylized image generator, you get a video in that style. Now that alone isn't very like that alone is cool, but it's not like, oh, wow. But look at this. So you don't fine tune anything. So the same text to video model that before generated these realistic scenes now generates scenes in the style, but also depending on the style, sort of how the video is conceptualized changes. So this here, this is just like, I would guess regular videos like you would expect. But if you look at, for example, this here, the, the, the whole con concept of the video changes to a sequence of stroke drawings, right? This is the same model, but just because the image features are now ones of drawings, the video generation adapts and now learns to, to, to produce drawing videos. Uh, if you swap in, there are other examples. Um, if you swap in this watercolor, okay, this looks still quite video-y, but if you see here, you sort of first get the shapes and then it colors them in. Uh, I find that to be really cool that by just swapping out the style, you, sort of the video part, the, the video portion without fine tuning it adapts to the style and changes the, how the, like the con concept of the videos themselves. <laughs> Not sure if everyone understood what I'm getting at, but I find that to be very, very cool. And then with a bit of fine tuning, you can achieve other stuff like masked, masked, um, video generation, uh, uh, video in painting and so on that the website here kind of crashes on, uh, on the iPad. So yeah, this is one of the things you can do. You can say, please constrain the, the generation to a mask. It's kind of a soft constraint. So as you can see, sometimes you can see some pixels are still 
generated or changed even outside of that mask, but uh, you can sort of fine tune and teach it to do that. All right, let's dive into the paper before this completely crashes. Uh, this is Lumiere, a space-time diffusion model for radio generation, as I said, uh, by Google Research. Researchers have different affiliations, but as far as I understand, the work was done while there. Sorry, I realized you uh, the video feed wasn't up to date. Should be fine now. All right, so the the um, the paper is has a large part on the architecture of the model and then what you can do with it. It has a m most minimal part on sort of what the data set is, how they trained it and so on, how long. So if you came here and thought we're in science and in science we're supposed to, you know, describe in a reproducible fashion what we did, you're at the wrong place. I'm, I'm not sure that's just not science anymore if you work at one of the big tech companies. Uh, what you do is you write your paper to be marketing pieces. Uh, so this is slightly better here than like GPT-4, but slightly. At least they give us the architecture. All right. Um, they say, they claim, or they, they, they start out by just briefly describing what they did. They say, we make a model, an architecture, uh, that generates an entire temporal duration of the video at once. Uh, this is in contrast to previous approaches, which first uh, synthesized keyframes and then kind of filled in the the in-between of the keyframes, which is called temporal super resolution uh, after the fact. Because they do that, they get more globally consistent and... Um, they get more globally consistent, more smooth motion. They don't get some artifacts that you get when you first generate keyframes. And it just, I guess, looks better. <laughs> You're going to see that it they extend the unit architecture. Unit, you might know from image processing, they extend the unit architecture to also compress in the time uh, direction. And by that, they can now generate a globally consistent video. Uh, they can generate all the frames at once. The important thing is all of this is built on top of a pre-trained text-to-image diffusion model. Okay, So the, the core part of this is a pre-trained fixed. They don't touch the weights of the pre-trained text-to-image model that they're using. So think of something like stable diffusion or something like this. They What they do is they make a process called inflation. And by that, they mean they use, they kind of build things around a pre-trained text-to-image model that allows them to generate video from it. Um, I want to actually... Maybe this part is good. Uh, they describe what the problem is if you generate keyframes. So in, in ye olden days, and they have, they have graphics here. In ye olden days, what you would do is, okay, this is your, this is your training sample up here. Um, yeah, up there is the training sample. What you would do is you would have a base model that generates keyframes. Okay, this, 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 this is a keyframe. And then you would use this temporal super resolution to fill in the in-between frames between the keyframes. And then you again you'd have keyframes and so on. You'd have temporal super resolution filling in those frames. And after that, you have what's called spatial super resolution to, to make the images bigger. Usually these video models, they operate at an extremely low resolution. You can see 128 by 128. And in the classic way, you you choose to operate at a low resolution in space and at a low resolution in time, right? So you generate distant keyframes and at low resolution pixels, and then you first fill in the frames between the keyframes, and then you do super resolution in the spatial direction. It's a very sensible approach, but it does have some problems. So. Again, what these models would do is uh, they say, okay, generate the keyframes first. 
and then I'll generate the in between things here. What's the problem with this? Uh, the problem is um, there are artifacts that can happen uh, when you do that. For example, this here shows an image where a ball is here. And then this here shows the image where the ball is there. Now it could have gone sort of here it was initially, right? Could have gone this way, could have gone this way, could have gone this way here. There is no way of knowing if you just produce the keyframes. So the model that decides to fill in these frames right here has to decide on one of the ways. Now that's, that's not problematic per se, right? As long as it does so kind of consistently says, okay, I'm going to choose this one. And then it just generates the keyframes here in according to what it chooses. The problem becomes if now the model that looks at this part right here, uh, makes another decision that is not in agreement with the model that looks at the first part, because you can't look at all the frames at the same time because of memory constraints. Uh, you do have to make decisions. So, and you do have to restrict your field of view. And so it could be that the model that looks at this part and this part, they make locally completely good decisions. However, they don't agree with each other. What I mean by that is they have a graphic right here where they analyze this. So in this part, they have imagine video, which I suppose does this keyframe technique. And the way to read these graphics is here is a generated video. And what they do is they look at just one X coordinate, like the one with the green line. And they take just the pixel values of that X coordinate of the first frame, and they put them here. And then they take the pixel values of the same X coordinate at the second frame, and they put them here and so on. So what you see at the bottom is essentially uh, time slices across the video of just a single X coordinate. Now, you can see that the video displays this humanoid thing walking. So what you would expect is you would expect sort of a foot going forward, foot going back, so kind of a continuous motion. However, what you see is this you go up, up, and then all of a sudden, you can see it goes up again. So you would expect that here, it should go like, should go on like this, but you can kind of see it, it janks around and doesn't do that. And then here also you get some artifacts where it's like up, okay, now but I stay here. And then I go up again. This is because you can imagine maybe, maybe, I don't know, but I guess one can imagine that there is a keyframe right here and a keyframe right here and a keyframe right here. And the model that makes the decision that the left leg goes up here and the model that makes the decision that the left leg goes up again, they don't see each other. It's completely consistent with all of the keyframes. Um, so, and the decisions are locally consistent. However, they are not consistent in a global sense, in the sense that the motion goes on like periodically. This is, you know, small things to bicker about all in all, but it does make for quite janky videos in that sense. And you have the feeling of there not being a global consistency to these videos. If you look at their examples, I don't know how cherry pick they are exactly, but you can see uh, that now we do get relatively smooth and continuous and globally consistent motion in these things. Now, how much of this is really due to how they train it? How much of this is due to whether or not in their training data, there, there was more of that type of motion or anything like this? Who knows? Like, <laughs> really, who knows? <laughs> whether that's due to, you know, all they did here was probably take the first frame and did conditional video generation based on the first frame and the same prompts. But obviously the videos here are going to be kind of different. And you can see from this parts right here, um, being not constant while these parts here are constant. 
that the right hand side seems to do some camera panning or something like this. So there's so many kind of differences between these things that it is hard to say where exactly the improvement comes from, but we're just going to believe them that keyframe based models have the problems on the left hand side, um, where you don't have global consistency. And if you do anything to achieve that global consistency between all the frames, then you can get more globally consistent uh, things happening, such as continuous uh, motion like this. All right. Yes, yes, yes. So we saw this uh, temporal super resolution between the keyframes generate the missing data between the keyframes in non overlapping segments. Well, so the ability to generate globally coherent motion using temporal cascades is inherently restricted. The base model, so the base model generates an aggressively subsampled set of keyframes in which fast motion becomes temporally aliased and thus ambiguous. The ambiguity being there are multiple ways to reach from one keyframe to the next keyframe, and the local temporal super resolution model has to make a choice. And because of memory constraints, it cannot look at all of the other, it cannot make this choice globally or in global agreement. Yeah, okay, that, that's that's what I said. Thanks, paper. And lastly, they say cascaded training regimens suffer from a domain gap where the TSR model is trained on real downsampled video frames, but at inference time is used to interpolate generated frames, which accumulates errors. That supposedly more minor uh, problem, but also plays in here. They say they circumvent that by using a space time unit, which they call StuNet that learns to downsample the signal in both space and time and performs the majority of its computation in a compact space time representation. This allows us to generate 80 frames at 16 FPS or five seconds, which is longer than the average shot duration in most media. So yeah, we have to discuss a little bit what it means to do video generation, right? This here is not really video generation. Like, yes, the, it meets the technical definition of video generation, but five second it's like five second animated pictures, right? That's it's different in my opinion from true video generation in sort of the sense that you would understand it if someone on the street told you, hey, I have a model that is text to video. For whatever reason, someone on the street might tell you that. Um so they they try to they try to hype it up still you know knowing that yes 5 seconds still is is not super long by saying okay this is longer than the average shot duration in most media so yes true but these shots in most media they themselves are then globally consistent across a 10 minute segment um and yeah so debatable whether that is really a fair or a, a useful thing to say. Um, this graphic I find helpful on the left hand side and extremely unhelpful on the right hand side. Uh, so it's just like, okay, we don't do keyframes. It doesn't yet tell you anything to use up like a quarter of a page for this. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's okay. But as you can see, they just directly generate all the frames right here. And there is a smaller difference as well. If you look here, uh, and you look at the boundaries between the segments, this is generated. So here you can see um, the spatial super resolution just operates on these kind of independent slices. And in this model right here, the spatial super resolution operates on overlapping slices. This is completely independent, as far as I understand, of the um, technique above. Like you could totally do that on the left hand side as well, I feel, um, because it's just, you know, how do you apply the spatial super resolution model that upsamples the frames in their dimension? 
So the spatial super resolution model, it upsamples the frames in their dimension, and it has the ability to look at the neighborhood of these frames while doing so, right? It, so it always looks at a chunk of frames. And what they do differently, it's like this is contribution number one up here and contribution number two is they say, okay, we do this in an overlapping way. So it avoids the boundary artifacts that might happen at the boundary in the classic sense. This, there is a reason why they stress this part so much. And they mention that, oh, we also do this. And I'll tell you later because it's quite funny. Um, but that process is now called multi diffusion. I know I'm, I'm hyping this up. Uh, so this is the, yeah. So yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> because they mention it already here. So they say in our model, the model works in pixel space consists of a base of a base model followed by a spatial super resolution cascade. Uh, and then there is a long text you can see, okay. SSR use temporal windowing approach, yada, yada, lead to inconsistencies in appearance at the boundaries. We propose to extend multi-diffusion, uh, an approach proposed to achieving global continuity in panoramic image generation to the temporal domain. So that's describing contribution number two right here. All right, back to contribution number one. This is the general architecture of the model. You will, if you or have been in this space for a bit, you will recognize this to be a sort of a unit shape. Um, a unit usually is think of think of an image autoencoder. So you get in you put in a training image, and you want to reconstruct that image, right. Um, so there there's some sort of model right here that usually compresses it to some lower representation, and then extends it again to some higher representation. Now, in the case of diffusion models, what you do is you put some noise on that image, and then you try to reconstruct the unnoised, the denoised image, and you do that in various level of noise. The whole model right here is going to be a diffusion model. So the this cascade right here is as far as I understand it, at inference time, you go through this many times. So you start with complete noise. And then you go through this, you get a slightly less noisy version. And then you go back, you go through this again, you get a slightly less noisy version, and so on. So you, you do this multiple steps, like in a diffusion model, except you do it on the whole video at once. Uh, so keep that in mind, but we're just going to take care of that single step right now. So the way the unit works is by saying, Okay, I, I'm not going to work at this full resolution scale. I'm going to process the image and downsample it in a learned way. So the, there's a learned downsampling, you can do that with a strided convolution or something like this. And I'm going to make that initially, it has three channels, right It has red channel, blue channel, green channel, I'm going to process this and get this to a lower representation lower, usually you if this is width and height, you do like width half and height half. So you get a quarter of the pixels, but now you can have many, many channels in this image. This is no longer an image. This is now like a latent representation of the image that just also has some spatial dimensions, but it has many channels, like many latent dimensions. Um, and then you do that again. So you process it. And one step of the processing is a learned downsampling step. So you're really small, and then you have maybe even more channels. So as your rest spatial resolution goes down, your number of channels goes up. And then eventually, you can do some processing in this latent space. That's usually where latent div like you can apply sequence models right here, which they will do as we'll see. And eventually, you'll do learned upsampling again, learned upsampling again, until you reach the, the final size again, there's some skip connections along the way. And you have a loss that essentially says, well, these two either should match or uh, whatever you output on the right hand side should be the match the denoised the original unnoisy version of the noised image on the left, depending on what your loss is. 
Now, why did I just draw exactly their architecture again? Like, couldn't I have just pointed to their picture? No, this here is text to image. And this down here is text to video. And what they do, even though it looks the same, it is not. And that's because they add an extra dimension here. You'll see that the actual tensor they have is four dimensional or yeah, so there, there are four axes to the tensor, there's height and width, and there is the dimensionality. So this is like RGB on the highest level, but then it is some hidden dimension down here. But then there is another one, the time dimension. So when they draw a stack of images like this, they mean time, they mean the temporal dimension. So this is the whole video, all the frames of a video is are stacked here. And each of those frames can have multiple channels, you just can't depict that as a 3d schematic on a 2d PDF, uh, you can't depict four dimensional things. But imagine that essentially, this whole stack is replicated um, for for each of the hidden dimensions. So there, there's going to be a red, a green and a blue channel here on the lowest level. But there is going to be many, many channels more on the lower levels. So not depictable, but it is different than text to image. So it adds an extra dimension. Um, but the rest is the same. Now, the trick here or so is that they apply this downsampling of height and width, like this learned downsampling, they also apply it in the time dimension. So you can see the latent representation is not only half as high is not only half as wide, but is also, if you consider it to be a latent video kind of is also half as long, or, or maybe has half the frame rate or something like this, right. So as you downsample, you also downsample the temporal direction. And as you do upsampling, learned upsampling, that is, you also upsample the temporal dimension, so you get longer again. How do they do this? Um, they build layers like this. So there is this, these are this is coming purely from the pre trained text to image model. So this is these are layers that and there are probably many layers. So this does not do justice, there's probably this is probably the small part. And then this here is probably the big part. So there are layers from the text to image unit that they just slap in here. And I'm going to guess they just apply them independently to all the frames of the video. And then there's some other stuff here, which is, I guess, all of this, they just introduced no, sorry, not this. Um, all of like these layers, they probably just introduced because they found it necessary. So these spatial layers here, they have they're going to have 2d convolutions just in sort of in the spatial dimensions. Um, then they threw in a 2d convolution again, possibly because they it helped. Um, and then they add a 1D convolution. And that 1D convolution is a convolution over the temporal dimension. So they don't do 3D convolution, they just don't naively extend the unit to another dimension. They do what's called a factorized convolution where they say, okay, we have one convolution working in 2D, which is like this classic image convolution, we do that on a on each frame separately. And then they have a 1D convolution that just works across the um, the time dimension. But as far as I can tell, and they don't say anything else, this is just considering, I would guess it's just considering a single pixel kind of but in all the frames, like the same pixel in all the frames, or well, if you want to call it pixel in the latent representation, I don't know, but sort of the same spatial location in all the frames. And then it makes it does a convolution across those. Okay, so I hope that's kind of clear. There are convolutional layers. And then at the lowest layer down here, when they are really compact, they now perform attention layers, because now they're compact enough to do some heavy duty processing. 
Again, they have pre-trained layers from the text to image model. These are spatial layers. I'm going to guess they're also convolutional. I don't know. They don't tell. Um, but then there's a 1D attention. So that 1D attention conceivably also runs across the temporal dimension and can now do some global information exchange, global consistency uh, in that very, very latent representation. You can see they have L of these. So they have, when, once you're in this latent representation, you're going to take this and you're going to push this through a stack of attention layers and out comes a same sized global, sorry, the my pen from the iPad is kind of weird. Uh, out comes a another same sized latent representation but if you've done everything correctly, this will now be kind of a, this will now represent a globally consistent video. Just downsampled to smaller width, smaller height, and smaller, smaller temporal resolution. Now, if you're like me, if you're like me and you're like, wait a minute, we started with a lot of, a lot of frames. Okay. And now we're kind of at very fewer frames and we're doing, sort of doing global processing on these fewer frames. And now we're just going to upsample them again in a convolutional way, right? Um, so out of, out of, at the bottom, you maybe have four frame or what is it, 80 frames in total? I don't know. You have like eight frames, right? Let's say four. At the bottom, you have like four frames, if you will. Uh, then you upsample that by two and you have eight frames in the next layer and so on. Aren't those just keyframes? Like, isn't the bottom, like the most bottom representation, isn't that just like analogous to keyframes? Isn't this just like a latent keyframey thing? So I can see the advantage. Because if you do the actual keyframe method, you construct the explicit RGB keyframes, uh, and then you they they cannot carry any information about the global nature of the like scene. But but it's still kind of keyframes, except here down here at the latent space. And given that this is convolutional, here's here's the point. Right? If you have, if you then generate even more frames, because of this is convolutional, the way that this frame and this frame communicates and achieves global consistency is purely via the cascade, um, via the convolutional field of view cascades uh, through the bottom layer. There is no way for these two pixels to achieve kind of global consistency um, in the layer that they're in. They're purely relying that these here are globally consistent and therefore the deconvolutions will sort of adhere to that. But that is a much longer path of information than just a direct kind of global agreement. So yeah, this is, you get the same problem as always with convolution in that if you generate an image and that image is the result of some kind of upsampling process from a latent small representation, then it is really hard to achieve global consistency in the image itself. And that's why some diffusion models operate in pixel space directly, right? Because there you, you can conceivably achieve better global consistency. So my point is like a little bit that if you tell me, oh, we generate all the frames at once, um, yes, that's true. However, what you do here is also sort of generate keyframes in a way, and then you upsample the key, you upsample the in between frames. Except you do it in this cascaded way, carrying latent information instead of doing it explicitly uh, without any chance of global consistency. Right, I hope that cleared some things up. So start out with a big tensor, all the frames stacked. You sample it down in both space and time. In a learned way, you sample it down more and more and more. At the very bottom layer, you do some attention layers uh, for 
to achieve kind of what you want in, in a sorry, and that are, you can achieve global consistency because attention, everything can access everything. And then you do convolutional upsampling again through multiple steps until you reach finally a, a, a video sequence, a, tempor a temporally extended video sequence in the original resolution. When I say original resolution, what I mean is 128 by 128. So this entire model operates at 128 by 128 scale. And now the goal is still, hey, let's make a video that actually humans want to look at. So how do we go from this to a video that's 1024 by 1024? Uh, so that's the, the job of the second thing in the model right here, the spatial super resolution thing. Right, these are actually, you know, these are these are two completely different different papers, different ideas, right? The paper could be done here and we're just, okay, for now we can do 128 by 128. But then there is this second step of spatial super resolution um, to make, make nice websites. All right, how do they, how do they do this? Oh yeah, first, I think it's important to again, highlight that the basis of all of this is a pre-trained text to image model, right? The heavy lifting that this does is done by these layers like here and the layer here, not layer, layers, right? From the, these are pre-trained text to image layers. So essentially what this model does is it relies on the learned text to image model to produce images and image signals and latent representations that are good at text to image. And then it uses a few learned parameters like 2D, like an extra 2D convolution and an extra time convolution to sort of make a smooth video that sort of transitions uh, according to, maybe also according to a prompt and according to the training data. But the heavy lifting is certainly done by the pre-trained text to image model. They say we train the newly added parameters and keep the weights of the pre-trained text to image model fixed, which then lends itself to this thing over here where they do stylized generation, but that in a second. First, I want to talk about this, this, um, SS, this spatial super resolution network. So they say the spatial super resolution network and inflated, but inflated, they always, as far as I understand it, they always mean we take text, text to image stuff and we make it, we modify it to do text to video stuff, right? Well, sort of making use of the pre-trained text to image weights. I, I think that's what they mean by inflated. So they say this can only, they operate only on short segments of the video. So its job is to take a series of frames uh, that are low resolution and generate a series of frames that are high resolution to essentially upsample them. Why can't it just look at a single frame? Because it wants to make the upsampling consistent. If you add details, you would like those t details to be consistent across the video you upsample. However, due to memory constraints, you can only look at a small segment at a time. So. That's the problem we're facing in this part of the paper. To avoid temporal boundary artifacts, so the boundary artifacts are okay. We use the model to look at the black boxed frames right here. And then we use the model again to look at these ones, right? And we upsample them. Well, how do you, how do you ensure that at the boundary here, you also do something that's consistent? Completely separate problem from the one before, but they decide to also tackle that. We achieve smooth transitions between the temporal segments by employing multi-diffusion. What is multi-diffusion? Multi-diffusion is the following. So that paper considers, um, considers what if I want to generate a really big image, but I only have diffusion models that can generate sort of parts of that. And then, okay, these parts might even be overlapping. How do I make sure that these parts here that are generated are globally consistent. And they formulate this as, okay, I have this diffusion model and I, I get in some input and then 
I have, um, yeah, they, they formulate this as an optimization problem where I can have this in a parameterized fashion and then I can have some, some loss around, you know, what I do. Like, okay, I'm gonna find the best, the best global image according to some loss and um, according to some parameters, which might even be learned that kind of minimizes this loss. So the loss could be a perceptual loss. The loss could be something else. What I want to say is this paper, that paper formulates this as kind of a general optimization problem saying, hey, we need to make sure that these regions match in some way. And it can even be that we, this is a learned procedure, right? We learn some parameters of how we should mix the different predictions from the diffusion models. That's multi-diffusion. So what they do is they say, we split the noisy input video into a set of overlapping segments. So these JI are overlapping segments uh, with a temporal duration that is shorter than the full video to reconcile the per segment predictions, we define the result of the denoising step to be the solution of the optimization problem, this one right here. Okay, as far as I understand it, this here is the noisy video segment. This here is a com the combination of the full model. So this here is the unit plus the super resolution. So whatever comes out of this is kind of the the prediction for that particular segment of video. And then obviously the i here, and then you will have another one, i plus one, and these two overlap here. So what should you do? How should you, this here they call j prime, how should you make the whole video? Well, the whole video is going to be the one that minimizes the squared norm between, you know, itself and all of the predictions individually, if you sum them up. Now, the astute observers among you will realize that this optimization problem here, um, in the way that's framed here, which I know is different from having a general loss and parameters and so on, the way that is framed here can be solved by a kind of unknown mathematical mathematical concept called the mean, okay? Um, it's obscure, but it, that is in fact the closed form solution to this optimization problem. Now, <laughs> why do they spend multiple paragraphs of this paper, including formulating this as a giant, you know, build it up as an optimization problem and so on, if they could just be like, yeah, we average this stuff. Um, <laughs> so multi-diffusion is a paper by an author called Bartal. Would you look at that? <laughs> so it is, it is, it took a lot of work but Omer here really got an extra citation uh, to his previous paper out of this by reformulating the concept of the mean in such a convoluted way that it warranted an actual uh, citation. And <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if, if this here is not necessary at all. And the whole, the whole, oh, it's so terrible to have boundary artifacts is just in here to get that citation. A bit shady, but also a bit clever. All right, what, do you, what can you do with it? All right, so this is, this part here is what I find to be quite cool. Um, and I've shown you this before in the website. Uh, they say, hey, since we only train the newly added temporal layers and we keep those text to image layers fixed, we could substitute these weights with a model customized for a specific style to allow videos to to allow us to generate videos with the desired style however they say if we do this with our trained model that there's like distorted static videos and so on um 
and they say this is probably because of a deviation in distribution. So yeah, if you just swap out some layers, then you're probably in an out of distribution regime for the rest of the layers because they did train. Okay, there are the pre-trained layers, and then there are like some they trained, and then there are pre-trained layers again, and then some they trained, and so on. So if you just swap out these, you'll like the signal to these layers, and then the signals to the layers down in the line, they'll change and probably without fine tuning might not be as good. So they say in our case, what we have to do is we have to interpolate. So there are the original text to image weights. And then there are the ones that are a style fine tune of those. And we sort of linearly interpolate between them. And that seems to work if we choose that coefficient manually. Keep in mind this works because this here is a fine to is in itself a fine tune of these weights right here. And so you could expect and there's some theoretical evidence in neural tangent kernels and so on. Um, that that these will will that will kind of work. <laughs> it, uh, I want to say, by the way, um, if we did discuss this paper, including these references and and explanations um, in our weekly Discord paper discussion every Saturday evening Europe time. Uh, we have that, and a lot of the things that I'm telling you here are actually not from you know me personally, but I get a lot of input from the community there, for which I'm very thankful. So if you're interested in discussing papers uh, once a week, join us on Saturday evenings. They describe here what happens if you do that. And I've already shown you before, like, okay, for more realistic styles, such as watercolor painting, it results in realistic motion. Others less realistic spatial priors, uh, for like for vector art styles, result in corresponding unique non-realistic motions. Line drawing styles results in animations that resemble pencil strokes drawing the described scene. Why is that? And I, I thought about it a bit, and the way I could explain that. Right? It, it is really special that because you would expect you would expect that these things right here, they sort of will generate video in a similar fashion if you have kind of the same prompt and, uh, but just because the text to image model is different, what I can imagine is in the training data, there will already be some sort of pencil stroke videos that actually show videos being drawn stroke by stroke, right? So, um, that is a terrible horse. But there will already be some of those videos. So these layers will already have a concept of pencil stroke drawing videos. And then when you swap out the models, the latent signal that comes this way essentially says, hey, this is, um, this is a pencil stroke drawing that I have here. And then the video layers will sort of swap on those parts of their learned distribution that correspond to to pencil drawings. So I believe the way this works, even though it's astounding, but the way this works is because there's already some of those kinds of videos in the origin in the training data of the of the text to video model. So the video layers already know what to do with a signal like that. So if you swap in the image layers to produce that style that the video models will kind of adjust. That's the way I can explain it, but maybe you have a different explanation. They also go over conditional generation where they now also include a mask, like a conditioning signal, um, conditioning video and a binary mask, and then they fine tune, uh, fine tune this different model, fine tune our base text to video model uh, to denoise the uh, video they want to produce based on the mask and the conditioning video. And you can do various things with that. Um, I'm not going to go into that. But if, if you want to know exactly how how that's done, uh, the text is here and explains a little bit what they what they did. But you can fine tune in various ways to achieve various results. Now this is what we're all here for. How do we reproduce this? Okay, we train it. That's cool. We can do that. We train it on a data set containing 30 million videos along with their text caption. That That's it. That's all you get. 
How long did you train it? How big is the model? What's the pre-trained text to image model? What's in this data of 30 million videos? What, what did, you know, what, the, how big are the layers? Um, how many, uh, how, oh, how many layers? We told you, look at, look at this clearly. It's L layers. So, you know, what do you want? How is this not reproducible? Just type L. Um, yeah, sadly, sadly, science is, uh, has died. They say we evaluate this on a list of prompts, uh, consists of 18 prompts assembled by us and 95 prompts used by prior work. They have a list of that prompt of those prompts. They don't tell us which one is which, I guess you can just go look at the prior work yourself to figure out which of the 18 prompts are new why they added 18 prompts, we don't know. What's the performance difference between those 95 and the 18 new ones? We have no idea. Um, they just, they give us some results right here. Now I have to say, these are sort of scores, um, fresh video distance, I believe, and so on. These are kind of automated scores. And if you're at this quality of video generation, these numbers really don't mean anything except that the overall statistics of the generated data is kind of sort of a bit similar, like the overall statistics of real data, like some statistics. So other than that, I would not lend these numbers any credence or any notoriety. You can see this, their, their model does well in them, but what does it mean? Who knows? This is quite interesting. So they gave them to people and asked people in a one-on-one -on -one comparison to rate uh, either their model or a baseline. And you can see that people generally prefer theirs. Um, the video video quality question asks something like, which is better, which has more motion and so on. So it's a bit guided, but the text alignment just essentially asks which one adheres to the text better. And you can see that there is a clear, clear winner in this. Although I have to say, I also have a criticism for that. They say participants were presented by with a randomly selected pair of videos, one generated by our model and the other one by one of the baseline methods, one of the baseline methods. So it's either they don't tell us which don't believe why they couldn't just tell us which of the baseline methods. What I much rather believe happened right here is that they just took one of these baselines and generated one. And then what you see over here is kind of like a, like the, the orange ones, they're, they're sort of mixed between different baseline models. So obviously you can make your model as good as you want, but just keep adding trash baseline models. So they pull down the mean, sorry, the very complicated multi diffusion optimization solution. And, uh, and then you, your your model is arbitrarily better, which I also find a little bit shady, I, I have to say, but I'm going to believe and also, I guess, if you look at the videos, you can see this is a improvement and a, a big step forward in text to video generation. All right. The last fun thing, Oh, the societal impact statement. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's as short as possible. And it, I, if you're a follower of this channel, you will know that they always are, they go technology, good, technology, bad, technology biased is <laughs> the most compact one you can imagine. Um, yeah, that's it in the appendix. You'll find, uh, list of prompts, user interface. These are the prompts they evaluated and so on, but that's the, the paper. So is this a very cool work? Yes. Uh, does it outperform probably a lot or most, or even all of the other things that exist? Probably yes too. Does it have some shady aspects? Definitely. <laughs> uh, let me know in the comments what you think. And yeah, if again, if you're interested in paper discussions, uh, every Saturday evening on Discord. See you around. Bye-bye.